now I, we will uh, now cover the uh, non-invasive imaging techniques uh, uh, of uh, CT scanning, CT angiography, and MRI. I will start with uh, the carotid arteries, and then uh, uh, Christina, uh, Christina Spina Klein, and Marianne Broadman will cover the lower limb arteries. So just uh, quickly to revise what you can get from uh, CT angiography and MR angiography is thank you, Don. Thank you, Don Vittorio. Uh, we can uh, assess, of course, stenosis severity. We can have information on the growth morphology, presence of ulcerations, presence of roof, uh, rough or smooth surface of the plaque. With MRA, we can get some fine characteristics which are associated with a higher risk of stroke, as we heard before, intraplaque hemorrhage and lipid-rich necrotic core of the plaque. We can assess the intracranial circulation, which is important in terms of identifying stenosis, uh, very fine the presence of the Willis polygon, the presence of aneurysms. And uh, particularly important when you plan carotid stenting is to, to assess the uh, anatomy of the supraortic vessels. If you have anomalies like the bovine arch and so on, that can make your life uh, a little bit more difficult. And of course, you can assess the brain parenchyma uh, with both MRA in particular and CT. Uh, and they have information about um, previous uh, ischemic injuries to the brain. So, uh, when should you ask for a CTA or a MRA for carotid artery disease? When you have a doubt from duplex ultrasound, for sure. And as we said yesterday, before doing any revascularization, you should either have two different ultrasound examination or an ultrasound plus a CTA or a MRA. And uh, in case of an asymptomatic carotid stenosis, you want to decide if it is worth uh, doing a prophylactic revascularization, so you may look for these high-risk plaque features. And of course, you can identify previous silent cerebral infarctions. And it's important for the surgeons to plan endarterectomy. All the surgeons have been doing it without CTA, of course, for decades. But anyway, you can uh, have a, a, an, exact, an exact measure of the extension of the disease of the common uh, carotid artery. You can evaluate intracranial stenosis. And uh, you may decide to use a shunt during the intervention if there, is, there are no posterior communicating and anterior communicating artery in the polygon of Willis. And it's very important for carotid stenting as well. So in the guidelines, duplex ultrasound, CTA, and, N and MRA are all class one recommendations for carotid arteries. And um, the sensitivity and specificity, specificity of both uh, CTA and MRA are very good. Uh, I would say excellent for the occlusions, so no doubt. Uh, for uh, severe stenosis, uh, the sensitivity of CTA is slightly lower than the sensitivity of MRA, but more or less you can uh, use either technique. On average, uh, the accuracy uh, with regards to the gold standard, which is angiography, is very good. This patient had all three examinations, and you see the degree of stenosis is very similar in all the, um, the imaging modalities. So what are the advantages of CTA over angiography? Of course, it's non-invasive. is uh, easily available in every hospital, I would say. It's a very fast exam. You can have all the uh, post-processing with multiple planar reconstruction. You can assess the vessel wall, unlike angiography, of course, and you can have a CT scan of the brain. Uh, disadvantages, low temporal resolution. You have no idea about the flow. You tend to overestimate the stenosis, and you have particularly difficulties in uh, heavily calcified plaques. Um, Post-processing is, uh, you know, the key uh, for uh, um, correct stenosis assessment uh, with CTA. You know, from one transversal uh, image, you get all the reconstruction on different planes. You can have the maximum intensity projection, and you can have volume rendering. Volume rendering is mainly for fancy, you know, because it's uh, you don't get any information from 3D volume rendering apart from <laughs> the tortuosities and the anomalies of the vessels. This is the kind of analysis that uh, we usually have for lower limbs before a TAVI, for example. But you can have it, uh, of course, for the carotids. That's reconstruction of the uh, carotid with uh, the diameter of the vessel uh, from the common carotid to the intracranial um, carotid artery. You can have, as, as we said, a volume rendering with these fine images. 
And um, one important thing is that uh, today you can have this double energy X-ray beam, CTA. So you use, uh, um, you reconstruct uh, uh, different series of monochromatic images with a, a polychromatic beam generated by the machine. And you have so a different series of images that I will show you. And using this different simultaneous acquisition of images, you can then subtract calcium. So one of the limitations of CTA is that it overestimates the stenosis where there is calcium. This is the same uh, image. After post-processing, you take out the calcium and you can assess the stenosis severity. This is an example. Here you have two simultaneous acquisitions from the same machine, the same contrast injection. And using the difference, be difference between the two, you can uh, increase the signal uh, to noise ratio with uh, iodine contrast and decrease the, uh, the bones and the calcifications. So you get this uh, cleaning of the, of the stenosis from the calcium. So if you have a radiologist, please ask if it's possible to have this kind of post-processing. And this is the volume rendering again. You don't get much information from volume rendering. This was a, a stenosis of the right internal carotid. This was the same, sorry, the same uh, post-processing on the left uh, carotid. You see there is a mild stenosis. It could have been overestimated with the blooming effect of calcium. And again, from the uh, volume rendering, you don't get much information, really. From volume rendering, you can get this information. For example, this patient has a bovine arch. So if you go for carotid stenting without knowing that the patient has a bovine arch, it can be tricky. Uh, it, it can take a lot of time. And sorry. Here, uh, you can also assess, very importantly, the presence of kinking and coiling of the internal carotid uh, distal to the, uh, the stenosis. In this case, there is no stenosis, but the kinking is very uh, important to know because if you want to place a filter there, you will have a bad time. So it's important to know in advance. So you can get all these nice images. You see the bovine arch. You see the tortuosity of the internal carotid artery, the tortuosities of the vertebral arteries as well. And um, it's all very useful. And it comes for free. I mean, it's just post-processing. MRA, sorry, MRA is non-invasive, no ionizing radiation, non-nephrotoxic non contrast medium. Uh, you have all the post-processing. You can assess the vessel wall and find plaque morphology, and it, you can integrate with brain MRI. Low availability, uh, higher cost, uh, low temporal resolution. It's also time-consuming exam, and very few Hospitals uh, have uh, radiologists who are able to uh, perform MRI of the uh, carotid arteries. Uh, the accuracy is quite good. Uh, you see here there is a comparison between the findings on MRA and angiography. And um, the, the diagnostic accuracy of uh, MRA is excellent, particularly for the carotid um, vessels, is a little bit less for the posterior circulation. But you can use either CTA or MRA. It's also very, uh, very useful for the uh, assessment of internal carotid dissection. It's very easy to see with that. Uh, regarding fine morphology uh, assessment, uh, um, you can use the different um, protocols of acquisition, time of flight, uh, T1 weighted, and so on. T2 weighted, you can identify the presence of a thin cap, atheroma. Uh, but it's not that easy. It requires a lot of uh, experience. You can find uh, you can find the hemorrhage, interplaque hemorrhage, in the, the TG, in the T1 weighted uh, protocol acquisition. Here, you can also identify lipid-rich necrotic core from the contrast announced T1 weighted. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, it's not that easy. So it's not something that you can routinely use. You can have, for research purposes, also hemodynamic data from MRA. Um, sometimes MRA tends to overestimate, uh, that's the so-called ringing artifact, and uh, when you have this kind of stenosis, you may have really an overestimation. That's one of the limitations of MRA. So I will uh, show you a, kin a clinical case. This patient uh, um, had uh, uh, diabetes, uh, not well controlled. And while doing screening for atherosclerosis, he had uh, this duplex ultrasound of his carotids, and it was found to have an occluded right internal carotid and a 60% stenosis of the left internal carotid. So he underwent MRA to confirm diagnosis and to assess the internal 
uh, the intracranial circulation. You see how <coughs> nice uh, are the views with uh, MRA. You see here he has a bovine arch. Uh, you can also assess the vertebral arteries. In this case, sorry. You see there is a kinking of the vertebral artery at the origin. It's not relevant in this case, but if you are uh, you know, planning some kind of intervention on the vertebral arteries, you should know what's the origin of the arteries. You can see also that the patient has a stenosis here, a stenosis of the left internal carotid artery, and he has the occlusion here of the right internal carotid artery. Yeah, sorry. The, yeah, it should have been here, the, <laughs> the tip of, of, of the arrow. And here you can see the intracranial circulation, and you can see that uh, the, re the right middle cerebral artery is uh, supplied from the left internal carotid artery. You can magnify the images. You can get this kind of nice image. This is the stump of the right internal carotid artery. You see the hypertrophic vertebral artery that compensates for the occlusion of the internal carotid artery. Here you have the stenosis of the left internal carotid artery. You see the images are very nice. You have this 3D depth of the reconstruction. It's really fascinating, I think. And you have all the posterior circulation. You see how nicely is the basilar artery, the posterior communicating arteries. That's the polygonal willis. You see here there is the missing internal carotid artery on the right side. This is the posterior communicating artery and the anterior communicating artery. So you know that this patient has a good compensation. <clears throat> so the, this patient afterwards, a couple of years later, uh, had a, a TIA. So we decided to perform uh, carotid stenting. And of course, here you see the bovine arch. So the access from the, the femoral artery is not uh, the easiest in this case, because you see you have to navigate through the tortuosities. Anyway, it was feasible, and that is the stenosis of the left internal carotid artery, which was treated with uh, distal protection. This is the, the stent that's going up uh, in the bovine arch, so uh, you must be very careful during this kind of procedure. Now the stent has been implanted here, and you see the result. This patient had uh, uh, afterwards had the wrist stenosis. is one of the few wrist stenoses that ha happened uh, in my experience. And on the second time, I went through the radial artery to uh, go across the um, bovine arch, but as you can see, it was not at all easier. <laughs> so in the end, uh, the use of uh, uh, you know, the, the information you get from uh, the CTA, uh, from the MRA, was not that useful, and, and then was the treatment of the carotid artery. So this is another case of CTA. Sorry. Mm. Oh, can you, okay, can you make the, the video run? Maybe I forgot the animation. Okay, so this is the standard uh, image that you get. You follow the uh, carotid arteries here. Then you go to the bifurcation. Here is a bifurcation you saw. So when you first have these images, you have to uh, focus on the slice where there is a bifurcation. Here is the, uh, the plaque with the calcifications, a large um, core, lipidic core. So you can magnify the images. Here you see the residual lumen of the uh, internal carotid artery is very small. There is a very large plaque and there is some calcifications also. These are the images that you can get with uh, the multiplanar reconstruction. You can see all the cores of the uh, common carotid artery, uh, right and left. You can have the bifurcation nicely displayed from all uh, points of view. You can reconstruct any uh, longitudinal image starting from uh, your baseline acquisition. You can see the intracranial internal carotid artery. You can see here again the origin of the vessels. You can appreciate the stenosis, the calcification that overestimates actually the stenosis. You see here this stenosis on the um, left carotid artery. Again, you can follow the uh, carotid artery uh, all through uh, the neck up to the brain, the intra intracranial uh, portion of the internal carotid artery. Here it is. You can reconstruct the, the entire artery. You can have 
all the measurements along the, the full length of the common carotid uh, to the internal carotid artery. So you get really a lot of information and you can plan your intervention very precisely and you can see also the posterior circulation. These are the vertebral arteries. A little bit more difficult to visualize because they, of course, they, they, they uh, go along um, the, uh, the vertebrae, so it's very difficult. And finally, these are the kind of reconstructions that you can get with a 3D volume rendering. Okay, this patient uh, underwent stenting and, okay. Um, I think I'm done. Just a couple of minutes, I'll show you the last <laughs> case. Sorry, can you make the video run, please? Okay, again, the supraartic vessels, you follow them. There's the carotid. Common carotid is not diseased on both sides. And here is, maybe, did you notice anything? Uh, if, if there is any disease, make it run again, please. So apparently no disease here. Common carotids. Did you see any disease? Okay, not very evident, let's say. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I'll, I'll show you now. So you have these reconstructions. You can see nicely the origin of the brachiocephalic trunk of the common left common carotid. Here is the, the entire length of the uh, common carotid on the right side and the left side. And then, yeah, you see uh, the course of the carotids. And here is uh, the stenosis. You see there is a very focal stenosis at the origin of the left internal carotid artery. Very focal stenosis, so in the transversal images you didn't notice it, probably. It was running very fast. But this is the, the exact origin of the internal carotid. So this is the external, this is the internal carotid. So that's uh, uh, a tight focal stenosis of the internal carotid. Then you can have the reconstruction of the posterior circulation, the vertebral arteries, the basilar artery, and the polygonal willis. Here you see there is um, hypoplasic communication between the anterior and posterior circulation. And this patient underwent um, successfully carotid stenting.